Hello and welcome to my channel, I am Zodiac Bandit, and today we have some potential spoilers and some spoilers for Campaign 3 of Critical Role, so if you aren't caught up, I recommend clicking off. Uh, there's also potential spoilers for EXU in here and some spoilers for EXU stuff, so again, if you aren't caught up, I recommend clicking off and uh, getting caught up on everything. So yeah, see you guys later for the rest of us who are still here. Let's get into the video. So for those of you who are still here, this is a video about why you shouldn't skip the EXU one shot that is coming up sometime in the next week. I don't know if it's going to be on the Tuesday or if it's going to be on the Thursday. They said the Bell's Hells will be back in two weeks, which would mean this week, unless they mean like two weeks from that post, which would be like the next week. I don't know. Everyone has a different interpretation of what like two weeks means or in the next two weeks. So yeah, a little lost on when that's going to happen. It might be on the Tuesday. It might be on the Thursday. Who knows? But I do think it's important for everyone to watch this uh, one shot of EXU that is coming up for a couple of reasons. It's going to sort of fill in a lot of gaps that we've been having with the Dorian character specifically. Dorian is a character who we've had throughout the entirety of Campaign 3 slash the beginning of EXU. And we've known him for a long time. It's been like three years now maybe. I think we're pushing three, maybe closer to two and a half. And... This character has been around for a long time, longer than some of the, or some, most of the uh, Bell's Hell. So realistically, this is a character that we've known for a very long time, and he even came in for the opening for the first 14 episodes. Dorian Storm was in Campaign 3. So he is a very important character, and a character that a lot of people have been wanting to see come back ever since he left. And we eventually got him back in the uh, two-shot for Kaimal, which happened. And then now we got him back at the second half of episode 92 when we caught up with the Crown Keepers. And now we're getting this EXU one-shot. And this is a character who they've been sort of communicating, they being the Bell's Hells, have been communicating with throughout the campaign. Now, it wasn't until episode 51 where that sort of communication stopped abruptly. And then it wasn't until a little bit later when the group came back from Ruidus that... Orum tried to communicate with Dor uh, Dorian after learning that sending spells were working again, but he got no answer. And this sort of EXU one-shot is potentially going to answer why Dorian didn't answer him back. Now, of course, it could have just been like the little, you know, underwater monster that they fought that was messing with them because that was a problem. But there might be an, another exterior reason as to why Dorian wasn't communicating with them. And I think the EXU episode is going to answer it, and I think... It's important for everyone to watch this episode for that reason. It's going to answer a bunch of questions about the Crown Keepers, specifically Opal and Dorian, and that's something I want to talk about here today. So when we're talking about this EXU one-shot, the outcome of this EXU one-shot is more important than what's going to happen within. Where all the characters end up is far more important for the grand scheme of Campaign 3 than what happens to the characters within this episode. Now, of course, they both correlate with each other, but it is more important to sort of think about how it ends and where people are going to be going from there. And there's three different outcomes that I can sort of think about for each character. And I kind of want to go over each of them briefly and sort of talk about how I think it could be important to the campaign three or how it could be totally irrelevant to campaign three. So let's get started. I do want to mention one thing before we start diving into where I think a lot of these characters could end up, and that is how the second half of episode 92 started. It started with the characters talking about how they feel like detached from each other in the group. Fira Rai is more focused about her, you know, her sister and things going on with her. Uh, Morgan is literally saying that any moment in time she could literally like turn on the group or leave the group if the Matron of Ravens want her to. Opal is obviously feeling sort of connected to the to the crown on her head and to Lolth the Spider Queen and you know she's feeling dark and feeling evil so she's literally like feeling detached from everyone else. She literally sneaks off and mumbles to herself at night when she needs to because there's this thing on her head. And then Dariax is sort of torn between sticking with Opal or sticking with Dorian and he wants to stick with both but he feels like there's a separation between them and Dorian literally says he doesn't feel right like traveling with this group. He feels like something is missing going on with all of them and like he feels like he needs to leave to find where that where that is like what's missing with him and i think that was like the biggest indicator that he's coming back to campaign three because i think what he's missing is the bell's hells so realistically this whole thing this whole exu thing is setting up the group separating in some form or fashion whether it be positive whether it be negative it has been set up that they're going to separate so i'm going to start off with fear i and morrigan these are two characters who have sort of gotten very little over the EXU time frame, right? Like, Fear Rai only got, like, three episodes in the original uh, EXU, and then she came back for the two episodes of Kaimal, 
and she honestly didn't get explored too too much in that time frame there was a little bit of exploration surrounding her sister and her connection to the wild mother but that's realistically it we didn't get too too much about her so she and morgan are the two who are sort of hardest to place in all of this i do think that there are three outcomes for every uh, person involved in this one the really boring one is they all die and i think that's really boring and i just want to throw that out there right now them dying is a possibility but is super boring so everyone with this outcome can die so then there are two different sort of outcomes that are both positive and negative so the positive one uh, for fear rai is i think that she with her connection to the wild mother could potentially go and sort of aid with the fight at the Malleus Key. Because her connection with a god, the god might ask her, hey, you need to do this, it's a higher calling than sort of dealing with your sister. And I think that is a potentially like good way for the character to be sort of involved in Campaign 3 still, and not necessarily be needed in the Bell's House. That she's going to join the Malleus Key sort of assault, and that is a good spot for her because the Wild Mother wants her to go there. The negative outcome is that she sort of just leaves the group, because the negative outcome will come with Opal's sort of ending. But I think the negative outcome is the group separates. Not all of them are dead. Some of them might be dead. But the group separates, and I think Fear Rai sort of just goes off and deals with her sister and the uh, Nameless Ones, the sort of gang that her sister is part of. And I think that is a negative one because she's not helping people anymore. She's going after a selfish uh, sort of goal to deal with her sister. And I think those are the two likely outcomes for this character. Unfortunately, Fear Rai doesn't have too much going for her as of right now. I think there is definitely room for the character, but as of right now, I just don't think that she has, like, the most development for me to be able to say, like, oh, there's going to be this deep thing surrounding her, and but anything like that. I think she is either going to help at the Malice Key, or she's going to leave and do her own thing. Those are the two outcomes if she survives. And then Morgan is very similar to Fear Rai, where she's got far less episodes than everyone else in the Crown Keepers, and it's kind of unfortunate because that means we've seen less from her. She literally showed up in Kaimal and then is in the half episode that we got before, and will now be in the one shot that's coming up later. So realistically, she's got three and a half episodes, and there's been very little room to explore her character. There was a little. She got a little bit of time dedicated to her in Kaimal, but it didn't give us too, too much. Most of her, what she wanted to do was leave Kaimal, and now she's left Kaimal. So with Morgan, the positive outcome for her and the negative outcome are kind of the same. One is she joins the Malleus Key Assault in the name of friendship with, you know, with Fear Rai, doing it for Dorian, with Dariax, for Opal, etc., etc. The negative one is that she's sort of being told to do it by the Matron of Ravens because the Matron of Ravens wants to save her champion Vax. And realistically, they're the same thing. She could potentially just leave the group, but the Matron of Ravens would probably want someone to you know fight for her at the Malleus Key and Morgan would be a character that we know very loosely but we know her and that would put stakes into the sort of you know Matron of Raven assault aspect of the you know attacking Ruidus and the Malleus Key so realistically unfortunately for Morgan she doesn't have like you know the deepest intentions we don't know where else she could go we don't know too much about her so unfortunately for her she's like directly tied with the Raven Queen and that's about all she's got she's gonna either be at the Malleus Key to help her friends or she's going to be at the Malleus Key to help her god and then we have opal now the weird thing surrounding opal is she seems to be the crux of everything that's going on within the exu one shot and she is the literal antagonist of the whole thing because she's being taken over by the spider queen she's literally fighting her friends which i think is actually a very unique place for her to be in and i think amy is having a very interesting time being by herself at that table which was really interesting but the outcome for this character is honestly it seems like it's going to be negative no matter what happens to her one the uh, crown keepers are able to remove the crown from her head that is what fear Rise goal is during the fight so for her to have the crown be removed would be positive it would separate the connection between her and lolf but apparently it's going to cause significant damage and might even kill her so the positive outcome which would be lolf doesn't get a champion is likely going to result in the death of opal so it's still technically negative for opal positive in the grand scheme of things it just means that opal won't be controlled by somebody but she won't have any control of herself because she'll be dead and the other likely outcome for opal is that she sort of embraces or accepts the uh, the toll or here with the crown that she accepts the outcome and she becomes the champion of lolf the spider queen and i do think that this is more likely out of the two because it just makes more sense there seems to be a lot of control there is no going to be winning over the crown the crown seems to be doing this regardless of 
what Opal wants. She is constantly like exerting black ichor coming out of her. It's making her feel gross and disgusting. The crown is asserting dominance over both Opal and Ted. So realistically, it doesn't seem very positive for this character. I think the only thing we could really like hope for in all of this for like a positive outcome would be Opal dies and then some sort of reconstitution happens because that was mentioned with the whole Luxon and the beacon stuff that I was mentioning. Maybe Opal is some sort of, uh, you know, reconstituted soul. And maybe when she dies, she'll be reconstituted again. And then her soul will go to the current dynasty once more. Who knows? I don't think that's how it works per se with the Luxon and the beacons or anything like that. I think they have to be like in proximity when they die, but there was a bit of a lore drop surrounding the Luxon back in the, you know, the second half of episode 92. So realistically, that's a possibility. There is a twinge of possibility there. But I genuinely just think that in order to save her friends so they don't all die, Opal is going to accept and become the champion of Lolf. And I think that is like the, the most negative slash positive outcome for the character because she won't kill her friends and she won't die. And then we get to Dorian. Honestly, Dorian to me is like the only one that has like zero negative endings here. He was already mentioning about how he was sort of feeling like he was drifting away from the group. So for him to leave the group no matter what and end up with the Bell's Hells seems like the most likely outcome for this character. I just, it's mostly about everyone else sort of around him and like how, what kind of mindset he's going to be going into working with the Bell's Hells. And I think it mostly surrounds Opal. If Opal dies, how is he going to feel about moving forward after that? And if Opal continues to be the champion of Lolf, how does he move forward with that? How does he go to the Bell's Hells and say, hey, I'm going to move on from what just happened and you know, not accept the fact that there's this thing running around that used to be a friend. I feel like if that happens to Opal, Dorian is likely going to ask the Bell's Hells if they could somehow deal with it, even though it is technically going to be a massive pain in the ass. But I could definitely see Dorian being like, hey, we need to deal with this thing before we continue moving forward. And I know we're kind of in a rough spot right now with everything going on. FCG just died, blah, blah, blah. But we need to sort of deal with Opal because she's going to be a problem. And I think that is something that Dorian would absolutely ask for. And if he goes through this whole thing of, you know, if Opal dies, that's one thing he can move forward from that. If she becomes Loth's like champion, I can definitely see him being hung up on that and potentially asking the Bell's Hells for help. So those are his likely outcomes. I just definitely think he's going to end up with the Bell's Hells. It's something that's been alluded to a lot over the last X amount of episodes ever since he left that Dorian will eventually return to the Bell's Hells. And I think it's going to be very cool for him to eventually do that. Maybe when he does finally return, that means there's like a 14 episode counter because they won't want him there for too long or they'll want to have it like mirror exactly how long he was with them for the first time. Hopefully not. Hopefully they're going to be like, nope, we're going to have him for as long as we need to in the next campaign because we love Dorian and we love Robbie. So yeah, definitely looking forward to the outcomes for, for Dorian here because I think neither of them are exclusively like negative or positive. They're just sort of blended together. And I feel like no matter what happens, he's going to end up with the Bell's Hells. And I think that's going to be fun. And last but not least is Dariax. Now, some of you might be curious why I left him to last. Well, that's because his outcome is sort of dependent on other people's outcomes, mostly Opal and Dorian, because when they were sort of walking through the woods and describing how everyone was feeling about, you know, how things were going, his was the most dependent on other characters in the group. He said he wanted to stick by Dorian no matter what, but he wants to protect Opal. And there's actually a third character who sort of like has influence over the Dariax character who I will talk about in a second. But if Opal ends up dying, I can see him going to the Malleus Key with uh, Dorian and then Dariax sort of fights alongside uh, the other two, that being uh, Fiori and Morgan in the, in the conflict. But I could also potentially see if uh, Opal becomes like the champion of the Spider Queen, that Dariax's sole goal will be to hunt down Opal and potentially try to save her on his own which I think would be more compelling for the Dariax character. I do see a version of like how the story goes of, you know, Opal is turned into the uh, champion of the Spider Queen and then Dorian and Dariax ask the Bell's Hells for help and then we have Matt DMPC for the campaign in Dariax who is just straight up just a character of his. And then bam, they spend a couple episodes going after her and then eventually after that, Dariax joins the others at the Malleus Key. I think that is like honestly what i would like to see the most out of all this uh it's kind of hard to say you know per se because we don't know quite yet but i genuinely do believe that dariax is the most like dependent on other characters and you know either the champion of the spider queen thing happens or opal dies of course 
this all hinges on the fact that those are the two outcomes for Opal. Maybe there is a way for them to pull the crown off her and she doesn't die. But Abria basically set it up that if they remove the crown, she's dead. So that's sort of what I'm rolling with here when I'm talking about all of these outcomes. Now, I did mention that Dariax actually has a third character who has sort of got some sort of influence over top of him when it comes to all of this. And I think that there is a third outcome for him that isn't just death. I mentioned earlier that everyone has two outcomes and then death being another one. Dariax has four. Now, everyone remembers the character Denise, right? Because I do. And she could definitely come in and cause some problems, potentially even join the uh, the side of good. Because I feel like halfway through the fight of the EXU set one shot, like Amy Carrero is going to lose control over Opal. And then suddenly, that's where Denise comes in. And I think that would be great. Because we know that Denise is on Dariax's trail. I feel like the person that they've been running from haven't been like the nameless ones. But like there's been like someone behind them as they've been traveling. And it's just been Denise the whole time. And I think that would be absolutely fucking hilarious. But if Denise were to show up, I think that would be great. Because now, someone can join her on, the, like, can join Amy Carrera on the other side of the table and her not be alone. Abria can just straight up fight with Opal and have her sort of, you know, be a true antagonist, not have, you know, Amy Carrero struggling to hit her friends or to roll the dice. And I think that would just be a lot better for everyone else at the table. For, for Denise to sort of come in and take over as Amy's character, and then they all fight Opal, and then depending on how things go, either Opal dies or becomes the champion of the Spider Queen. And after that, Denise could affect where Dariax ends up. I think Dariax could potentially just outright retire with Denise if the character does show up. And I think that would be a great way for, you know, Dariax to sort of go away, for Denise to sort of go away, and then Morgan and Furai go where they want, and Opal is either dead or is now the champion of the Spider Queen. So realistically, a lot of these characters get tied up really nicely with Denise showing up. Specifically, Dariax and Denise get tied up really nicely with the two of them going off, living whatever life they can for the rest of the days that potentially are still around because Rudis might end everything, but who knows. And I definitely think that that is a nice way to sort of wrap up Denise and Dariax because we learned a lot about Dariax through Denise and I think that is just a nice little way to end the Dariax character. And that way we don't have to have a DMPC because there's going to be eight players at the table with Dorian joining the group and Sam's new character hopefully joining the group. And hopefully he didn't say, see you in campaign four and fucking meant it because that would suck ass if Sam actually meant that. Like I said at the beginning of this video, it is important for us to watch this one shot of EXU to know where all of these characters end up. Specifically, Opal, Dorian, and Dariax. They're the ones who are sort of like the most important to all of this. How they sort of play into everything because like I mentioned, their parts in everything seem to be the most important. Because Dariax is a big support character for a lot of the players, for, you know, specifically Dorian and Opal. So where he ends up is kind of interesting. He could either be sort of seeking vengeance against Lolf, and then he could either be aiding Dorian, or he could be retired because of Denise. But I do think knowing where these characters end up is extremely important. Because there's been a lot of, like, crossover with everything going on. EXU has crossed over a couple times, specifically with sending messages and scrying. So it's very important for us to understand where these characters end up because they've been a part of Campaign 3. Yes, it's been in the background, but it is definitely very important for us to know what's been happening with them and what happens to them now because of their sort of crossovers with campaign three and it's it's a nice overlapping story you know there's in every story you read there are characters doing anything at separate times that we don't necessarily see there's a bunch of characters moving there's a bunch of characters talking there's a bunch of characters doing everything it's like a living breathing world and i think camping three has done the best job of doing that of making the world feel alive as if stuff is moving around even when the bell's hells have nothing to do with it and because of all these crossovers because of the guest players who we know are doing other things at other times we know this and i feel like it would be a disservice to campaign three to skip out on this one shot to not watch to not understand where dorian has been to not understand what dorian has gone through before he's gotten back to the bell's hells and i genuinely do believe that it's super important for this one shot to be viewed now some people are negative about the whole idea of them, you know, cutting off the episode halfway through. Some people dislike Abria Iyengar as a DM. Some people just don't like the characters. Some people think it's stupid that the fact that they didn't watch Kaimel, they didn't watch EXU, and now they have to watch this. Again, I genuinely think that if you are a fan of Critical Role, you should have probably watched those anyway. You know, I wasn't a big fan of Kaimel, but I still watched it. I thought EXU was great, and it was a great way to, like, sort of 
bridge the gap between campaign two and campaign three and it's you know secretly without us knowing at the time introduced us to the uh to a handful of characters in the bell's hells which was campaign three and i thought like you know this world feels more connected than ever with all of the characters crossing over with different you know like uh, mini series like exu with characters from campaign one and two showing up the world feels the most connected that it's ever been and i feel like that is very important to know when talking about one shots like this and if you should watch them so realistically yes this should be watched yes it is a bit of a pain in the ass to sort of have to keep up with everything going on but it is important to understand where the story ends up because some people are going to be like well why is this character here now and they're going to not watch the stuff that told them and then they're going to complain about it it happens all the time so realistically watch the fucking episode and I was just about to sign off, but there's actually one more form of order we have to sort of take care of, and that is the Critical Role Bingo, or the Crits uh, Bingo sheet that we have. We're able to fill out two more slots on it, the Return of the Crown Keepers and a new EXU. Technically, technically, it's not a new EXU, but it is like a new part of EXU, so I'm going to count it anyway. A new, a new one-shot of EXU is what's happening, so that's perfectly fine. And yeah, just felt like I'd throw this in there at the end. I forgot to mention it at the end of the uh last episode or at during the recap which i should have mentioned but i'm mentioning it here so now we have the um more of the bingo card filled out so with that i will now sign off i will see you guys on tuesday for whatever video i make next until then peace